All right. Um, have a message, I think. We're still in First Samuel. You thought we'd be in Revelation by now, didn't you, Brother Dan- Daniel? <laughs> no? We're still even in First Samuel chapter 2. <laughs> Made a lot of progress. And uh, actually, uh, last week was actually more like a scatter fire. We, we hit a lot of things. It was more like a topical, but it, uh, it, it was based out of First Samuel. But um, this, uh, this week, I wanted to use this board, and I wanted to ask you a question. Are you a mog? Are you a mog? And um, what does that mean? I don't know either, but we're going to find out. <clears throat> Are you a mog? So many people in this world, uh, they want to get all they can as quick as they can uh, with the idea, this is the overwhelming idea, whoever dies with the most toys wins, right? And you, you meet them on the street, maybe you live with them, I don't know. Uh, you, you know them, they're in your family, and that is the mentality of this world. Get as much paper as you can on the wall, you know, make as much money as you can, drive the newest car that you can, and, and uh, it's a drive that people therefore, uh, um, let, let me put it like this, my, my wife worked within nursing and stated that it became ab- abundantly clear that with people who pers- pursued a trade of nursing, like she was in, for money. Now, I don't know if you guys know this, but uh, a regular RN, if she takes her uh, overtime and stuff, they can make six figures a year, a regular RN. So what, what happens is that you have people getting into this trade simply for the money. But the nursing trade is actually more like a nursing ministry. Uh, Kenneth could tell you all about it. Uh, caring for people is not something everybody is able to do. Uh, now, um, so but people get into this thing just for the money and not to care for sick people or sick and hurting people. Um, they're in it for the money. They they want to get all they can as quick as they can. And this would come out of their lack of care for individuals. She would notice, why is this person still sitting in this dirty diaper? You know, that was your job. Oh, well, yeah, you didn't care about that individual. If that was your mom, if that was your grandma, you know, you would have probably done it, but this is someone you don't care about. Now, isn't it just like most people to do that? Pursue the money instead of uh, caring for individuals. Now, they pursue a trade. They pursue education and direction, not because they prayed about what God wants them to do. Right now, I'm talking about Christians. You talk to Christians. uh, What possessed you (laughs) to go in that direction? Oh, well, I got a better job. Okay, did you ever think to pray about if God even wants you to have a better job? Well, no, I just saw the money and I moved. Okay, well, is it going to be God's problem when you end up backslidden on the Lord because you moved uh, to a place that has no church to go to? You moved to a place that there are no brethren, you know, that you can grow with and, and fellowship with. Is that God's fault? No, I don't think so. And uh, now I haven't been preaching and pastoring for 50,000 years like a lot of folks, but in my few short years, I've seen families move to different areas where there was no like-minded church. There was no fellowship. And what happened? They backslid. And I asked those individuals, how did God tell you it's time to move? And they got the question mark. And that's it. And time tells all, and time said that God didn't tell him to move. And um, now, uh, there's no care for how this job will get in the way of church when they move, or get in the way of Bible reading when they move. See, this is one thing I've learned, that every time you change a job, your whole schedule gets rocked for like about a month. 
and you're, you're just you're, you're you're on the boat and the boat's rocking like this and you're like because at your old job you used to always oh this is my time i read this is my time i pray and then you change jobs and now you're like ah and guess what god cares about that stuff um Sometimes the job itself people move to by chasing the dollar bills will make them to compromise their biblical convictions. What a shame. You know, um, now I, I, I've heard of individuals, they get saved, they work in a liquor store, they work in a casino or something like that. And now that they're saved, they're like, what do I do? Hey man, that, I, that's a more un understandable position. But when you are a Christian and you're like, you know, I'm going to go work at a liquor store. I'm going to go work at a casino. What? For the money is great. I'm sorry, man. That's going to make you to compromise your biblical convictions and your testimony. Now, the scary thing is that saved church people seem to be as careless about God, what God thinks about their job as people in the world. A lot of times. They just could care less. I just got, hey, you know, everyone's got to make a buck. And you ask them why they chose the job. It has nothing to do with God, the Bible, or a sacrifice to put God first in any of it. Now, um, they merely chose a trade we talked about. They were compelled by income, or compelled by status, or by having the least required of them. What was that, Mary Chris, what was that book called? It's like the rule that, you know, the, okay, so I've, I should have read the book, but I've only heard about it, but it's interesting. It's this idea called the Peter Principle, that uh, they push people up into a bracket that they're not able to perform, because they've done well lower. When they did so well, they push them up into something they won't do well, and that's the Peter Principle. So someone who is good at, at a teacher, now they make them a superintendent, and they just totally fail when they should have left them when they, where they were good at, at being a teacher. You know, and they, I guess uh, the book calls it the Peter Principle. But the thing is uh, simply that where God places you and you're flourishing, you should really think about that. You know, before you just up and leave it because a few more bucks. Um, now... In our text, we're, we're here in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I want to look at verse 27, and I'm going to read you some Bible today. And I want to be the pastor that's guilty of reading too much Bible often. Okay? So uh, we're going to read more than two verses today, and you're going to bear with me. All right? We're in 1 Samuel chapter 2. I want to look at, start in verse 27. We're going to go to verse 36. It says, There came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Did I plainly appear unto the house of thy father when they were in Egypt in Pharaoh's house? And did I choose him out of the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? And did I give unto the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire of the children of Israel? Wherefore kick ye at my sacrifice and mine offering, which I have commanded in my habitation. And honorest thy sons above me to make yourselves fat with the chiefest, chiefest of all the things of Israel, my people. Wherefore, the Lord God of Israel saith, I said indeed that thy house and the house of thy father should walk before me forever. But now the Lord saith, Be it far from me. For them that honor me, I will honor. And they that despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the day is come that I will cut off thine arm and the arm of thy father's house, that there shall not be an old man in thine house. And thou shalt see uh, an enemy in my habitation in all the wealth which God shall give Israel and there shall not be an old man in thine house forever and the man of thine whom I shall not cut off from mine altar shall be to consume thine eyes 
and to grieve thine heart. And all the increase of thine house shall die in the flower of their age. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall die, both of them. And I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before mine anointed uh, forever. And it shall come to pass that uh, every one that is left in thine house shall come and crouch to him for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, and shall say, Put me, I pray thee, into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a piece of bread. Now, um, in our text today, we'll bring your attention to the first verse. We're going to spend most of the time in these first few verses. Um, are you a mog? And we find out what a mog is in verse 27. It says, there came a what? A man of God. Are you a mog? Are you a man of God? And to the ladies here, just apply it to yourselves as well, okay? Uh, can you be used for the Lord, okay? Are you a mog? Um, so the first thing I want to look at this uh, in this thing here is um, we're going to look at a few characteristics of this man of God and we're going to see how we as a church, how we as men, as we as uh, Christians measure up. And the first thing I want to look at is are you willing to be a nobody? Are you, are you willing to be yeah, a nobody? Now, why would you say that? Because this man of God has no name. He has no name. There came a man of God. That's all we know about him. Just some no name. You know, uh, that's the thing I think with a lot of church people. They're not willing to be a nobody. You know, if they don't get a pat on the back, which in our church, we don't have to deal with this. Small churches don't really have to face a lot of these things, but you get into larger churches, uh, people won't do something unless they get recognition. And it, you're not going to get far with the Lord if you're not willing to first be a nobody. Uh, think about it. With salvation, can an individual get saved if they never realized they were a sinner? No. No. You have to realize your need, your necessity, your lack of before you can come to the Almighty for salvation. Amen. And uh, as far as uh, in the Christian life as well, you have to decrease so He can increase. And uh, if, you, if you keep increasing, the Lord will then keep decreasing in your life. Why? There is only one throne in your heart. And uh, there's only one rear end that can sit on it at a time. Now, uh, this man of God showed up on the scene, and the only people who knew who he was was Eli and God. And that's it. And if you're familiar with the text, Eli didn't live much longer after this conversation. So, we actually don't know this guy's name. And I haven't looked into Josephus to find out if the Jewish rabbinical traditions give a name. But all I know is, thus saith the Lord, doesn't give a name. His name is Man of God. That is His name. That is all God wanted you to know about Him. That He was a Man of God. Are you willing to be a nobody? Now, um, God must, must have sat down with this man and simply said, Do you love me? He said, Yeah, I love you. Well, uh, would, maybe, maybe he would have said something like, Sure, yeah, yeah, I love you. Uh, then God says to him something like, uh, Would you do something just for me? And the guy's thinking about it. He's like, yeah, I'd do something just for you. Okay. He says, sure. Then, then God asks him, go rebuke Eli the priest. And the guy's like, rebuke another man of God? And uh, I wonder if, if he brought up that, that. That wouldn't help the cause of Christ, rebuking another man of God. Um, that, that, wouldn't, that would make me rather unpopular with the brethren if I rebuked another man of God. 
uh, uh, that will make my people at, at the church I preach at leave. They would leave if I rebuked another man of God. Uh, and then God says, would you do it just for me? So he sat there and thought to himself, all right, Lord, I'll do it just for you. So God says, I'm not even going to give you a name when I write it down. That's okay. You know. Are you willing to be a nobody? He, he made no introduction. He didn't say, here I am. I'm the man of God. He didn't say, my name is whatever it may be. Um, John Doe. <laughs> you know, he waited for no greeting. I want to point that out. You know, uh, there's people that leave churches. They didn't even say hi to me. <sighs> he waited for no greeting. Uh, he didn't wait for a red carpet VIP invite either from Eli. Now, uh, he didn't first explain his credentials. Now, everybody knows in public speaking. You have to first, you know, you have to establish your credibility among the people. And, you know, I've done this great thing. And I have these many alphabet letters behind my name. And therefore, you should listen to me because I'm the man of God. He didn't do any of that. Yeah, look at verse 27. It says, There came a man of God unto Eli and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord. That's all he said. Now, a, a preacher could have a lot of fun with I mean, we, we could draw a bunch of conclusions. Did, did he have his you know, fingers in the chest of Eli? Or did he just walk in the same room and kind of sit behind Eli and thus saith the Lord? And Eli's like, whoa, I didn't see you. I know you didn't. You haven't been thinking a lot about the Lord lately, have you? Have you, Eli? That's why I stood behind you. And so, I mean, there's a lot of things, a, a real colorful preacher, we can, get, we can get out of that. But all we know is he didn't say, look, I'm a man of God, and I'm a better man of God than you, because I'm still a man of God, and you're about to not be a man of God. And, you know, I've been a man of God longer than you. I'm taller than you. I'm stronger than you. I got, I got credentials. I got a PhD. Yours is only honorary. I don't know. I mean, you don't see any of that. Why? He was willing to be a nobody. Amen. Are you willing to be a nobody? Um, look at Amos uh, 7.14. Amos 7.14. Amos chapter 7 and verse 14. And in Amos 7, 14, we're, we're, Amos says something here. He says, Then answered Amos and said to Amaziah, I was no prophet, neither was I a prophet's son, but I was an herdman, a gatherer of sycamore fruit. That's my credentials. I was a mechanic. Uh, I was a drywall installer. Uh, I, I was a garbage man. You know, uh, I <laughs> I was a turd chaser. <laughs> what was that company called? The guy that would pick up turd tracker. <laughs> There's a local company. I don't even know if they're open, but he'd pick up people's dog poop, and his company was called Turd Trackers. <laughs> kind of witty. But, I mean, in essence, who is he? He's nobody. He, that guy is willing to be a nobody, isn't he? Isn't he? Are you willing to be a nobody? Randy, that was application. I know. I know. You didn't think you were going to get the depth, the depth that you were today. All right, turn your Bible again. All right, let's go back to the Bible. 1 Samuel 15, verse 17. But you know, uh, Amos, he says, look man, I, w I'm not, I wasn't a prophet. Look man, I wasn't even a prophet's son. You know what? I, I was just gathering fruit off the sycamore trees. Who am I? 
but I got a message from God, and it's for you. Now, uh, in 1 Samuel 15, 17, uh, we notice something else here. And we notice Samuel, years after our text that we started in, and Samuel said to Saul, he says, When thou was little in thine own sight, was thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. Now, what happened with Saul is he started believing what everyone was saying about him. You know, and that's, that's a problem. Why? Because your enemies have some validity in what they're saying about you. I mean, probably not the whole thing is right, and I get that. But why would they have an inch to say anything like that? You know, aren't we supposed to be above reproach? And the thing is, uh, a lot of times we get out there and we're fighting our own battles, and you know, for, for, for my honor! That's right, it's for your honor. It's not for the Lord's honor. Why? Because you're not willing to be a nobody. You know, uh, I remember uh, when I was first uh, become a Bible believer, um, I, <laughs> I would just come out swinging quite often. <laughs> and, well, hey man, hey man, you, you got the Bible on your side? And anyway, uh, I started talking to this fellow from a local congregation. And he said, you know, but all these scholars, all these professors, and, and I said, you know what, who are they to me? And he just threw that back at me. He said, you know, who are you? And I said, I'm nobody. You know what, um, I'm just some, some old uh, snorting, speed, smoking weed. I mean, by God's grace, I didn't become a crackhead. You know, uh, I should be dead. That's who I am. You know, and uh, a lot of the, a uh, lot of the uh, things probably cause brain damage, and God's probably given a lot of it back. And I am, I'm amazed I can even read. <laughs> you know, I never used to read, and that's who I am. I'm nobody. I got nothing good. You know, if uh, every good and perfect gift cometh from the Father of lights. If there is any, if you get anything good out of today, if you've gotten anything good out of this church, we know it wasn't me. <laughs> Amen. And uh, that no flesh may glory in His presence. Now, um, the problem is a lot of you won't do something for God. Is That won't do something for God is that you still think that you're somebody. You think you're somebody. Now, um, you care too much about your reputation and what people think about you and not what God thinks about you. You think about that situation where the man of God uh, was getting talked to by God and God's like, I have a word for you. Well, I'm going to lose my reputation if I go rebuke Eli. He's the priest. Yes, you are, but I asked you to do it. Do I not have the right as the Lord to take your reputation? I gave it to you anyway. You don't think I can give it back? Who are you following? My honor! Okay, well, have fun with that. And that's what God does to a lot of Christians because they care too much about themselves. They're not willing to be a nobody. That's a double negative. Uh, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> They are uh, so dedicated that they think they're somebody. They're not willing to lose the title, the prestige. My question to you today is, are you going to be a mog? Are you going to be a man of God? Are you willing to be a nobody like he was? Now my second question is, uh, are you willing to go where God tells you to? Are you willing to go where God sends you, where He tells you to go? Uh, in 1 Samuel 2.27, our text, it says, There came a man of God unto Eli. He could have went anywhere that day. He could have went to Hawaii. <laughs> he could have went to work. He could have went... Uh, Maybe his favorite TV show was on. Maybe he could have went to go watch his favorite TV show. 
Shar's like, Randy, I don't think they had TVs back then. <laughs> you get what I'm saying? I wonder how many places the Lord has told you to go and you've not been willing to go. I wonder. You know, maybe it's just downstairs. Maybe it's uh, just in the next room. Uh, maybe it's outside. Uh, you can locationally be in God's will. Locationally. Now, um, th there's been times, I know you've never been like this, you've never been backslidden, but there's been times in my life where I was so backslidden where I felt, you know, I, I would have to claim that verse that uh, I'm probably going to even quote it wrong, but in, in the presence of two or three, there am I in the midst. And you know what? I would say, you know, God is so far away from me that I know if I sneak in his church service, he'll be there. He can't ignore me there. Because there's two or three right there and he has to be there. So I'm just going to sneak in the back. You know, and he'll have to be around me. You know, and... Uh, but that... What's my point in saying that is that you can be in the right place. You know what I'm saying? You can be in God's will locationally. Just like you can be out of God's will locationally. You can be doing the right thing at the wrong place. You know, uh, if you're in a library and somebody is reading an atheist book, you know, that could be a perfect situation to say, have you ever read that book? But instead, you do the right thing in the wrong place and you say, the Bible says! You're in a library, bro. Keep it down. Or else we're going to escort you out. You see? Oh no, I was preaching and they arrested me. Yeah, they arrested you because you're an idiot. You see? You see, you can do the right thing in the wrong place. But guess what? You can be locationally in God's will. At the risk of sounding old-fashioned, out of date, I believe it's God's will that people should locationally be in a church when they're not providentially hindered on a Sunday or any given time that church meets. That's kind of old-fashioned. But Randy, you know, we are the temple. And yeah, I know. And you must not, you're arguing this fact because you must not like going to church too much. You know, and the fact is, if you were going to church more often, uh, those brethren would knock off some of those rough edges. And that's probably what you don't want. You don't want people to check you. You don't want to be accountable. You don't want to be responsible. You don't want to have to answer for your actions. You don't want to have to answer for being an idiot. You know, and uh, your wife can't tell you nothing, and that's why you don't want to be around the brethren, because they're not scared of you. They're going to tell you. And uh, that's why you don't want to go to church. Amen? <laughs> they don't. And the fact is, I mean, I'm, I'm preaching the choir here, but church is one of those uh, things that tells you a lot about a person. Are they willing to get preached at? A lot of people aren't. You know, uh, Madonna writes her songs about Papa Don't Preach. You know, what's the worst thing you could do is preach to people. That's the worst. I could have sworn this morning we were just looking at a Bible verse. What was it? 1 Corinthians one twenty one. Oh yeah, there it is. For after that, in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching. To save them that believe. Oh, don't preach. Oh, don't preach. Don't preach now. Uh, God likes preaching. Amen. You know, and um, you're not having church at a barbecue at a volleyball game with Christians. Okay, uh, local churches put that in their statement of faith that we don't believe church is so structured. You know, we could just be at the softball game, like fellowshipping. You know, you're not having church if there's not preaching and an open Bible. You're not. You might be having good fellowship. Amen. But that's not church. You know, and you have to submit to preaching. Okay, I do too. Uh, Mary Crystal, tell, I listen to messages all week long, and I'm getting kicked in my craw all week long, and I need more of it, and uh, I do. If you've known me for five minutes, you're like, amen, amen, brother, you need more, and I do, and um, you can never be to the point where you can't receive getting preached at, and a lot of uh, street preachers are the worst at it. 
I know, I'm one of them. <laughs> I know. I know. And uh, a lot of people today are not uh, willing to allow a preacher to take a few loving swipes at them with the Bible. Loving swipes. You, you know, uh, nobody's getting up here saying, how can I ruin Katie's day with my message? You know, it's like, no, I'm thinking, how can I help Katie this week? You know, can I give her something that will strengthen her? You know, can, can she learn anything from this man of God? You know, can this church grow from looking at this man of God at all? You know, is there any profit in learning to be a nobody? There is. There is. That means you can only please God when you do your things. <laughs> Amen. Th that's gold. That's gold. There's gold, silver, precious stones. Whatever you do for God and God alone is gold. It's going to come through the fire. What? If you learn how to be a nobody, if you learn how to be willing to go where God sends you, you will benefit. <laughs> Why? Because he told Lot to leave Sodom and Gomorrah, and it helped him. <laughs> it did. He lived another day to talk about it, you know. And uh, we will benefit. We will learn from the Word of God and from biblical preaching. Now, a lot of people, they want to get out on the street and call hellfire on everyone that looks different. Amen. Amen. I'll, I'll amen myself. And uh, if these people are not locationally in the will of God, whenever their local congregation meets for that period of time, they are sinlessly perfected people are in sin and imperfect locationally. Yeah. So, a lot of the street preachers, they're sinlessly perfected. Right? They're like, you dress wrong. You're cursing. You're smoking. That's right. And where were you on Sunday morning? In sin. Exactly. Okay, amen. Bye-bye. Everyone's got something. That's right. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. What, what is it? Is, is it in First John again? What is that uh, sinless perfection verse they never want to look at? Where is it? Could have sworn... It's right over here in 1 John. And it says in verse 8, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, like a lot of sinless perfection people do, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Amen. Who wants to listen to your preaching? What help are you going to be to anybody? You know, um, well, let's get off that. I think we've said enough. But some people are just not willing to go where God told them to go. Per se, God told you to stay in your hot, dusty, dirty town for another 10 years, even though you're struggling financially, only because you're able to grow at your local church. Does God have the right to do that? Amen. But it's so hot. It's nasty out here. Uh-huh. And the brethren need you. <laughs> Yeah, did you ever think that there's more to life than you? More to this world than you? What is it? There's, uh, there's, there's uh, geocentric, and that's the universe goes around the sun. There's heliocentric, that's the everything goes around the earth. And then there's eucentric, and that means everything revolves around you. You see, and a lot of Christians are like that. Well, I didn't appreciate your message. Well, three people said it was a good message. They liked it. You know? Well, you didn't ask me. No, I didn't ask you because I didn't care what you thought. That's why I didn't ask. <laughs> well, I think you should ask. I don't think I will. <laughs> and now that you think I should, now I probably won't just because you think I should. You know? And... <laughs> Anyway, on and on, on and on. Now, um, a lot of times people will move with no question um, if there's a good church in the area or if God wants them there at all. Now, um, I recently read a book comparing the soldier with a Christian. And uh, it stated that soldiers, think about a soldier. They're going to lay in the trench in the rain for days, weeks, months at a time. Like these guys will get fungus growing on their skin because they can't bathe. What are they doing? They're just sitting in the trench. This is a soldier. And um, they're being shot at. They're being hunted and hungry. Uh, for what cause? The flag. Okay, and I'm not saying that's not honorable. 
And I think the reason this application makes so much sense is because it is honorable. But yet a Christian can barely sit in an air-conditioned church on cushioned seats for an hour. You see? Now, uh, maybe some of you, your flesh is already crawling. You're like, why did he take down that clock? <laughs> I took it down because all of our flesh wants to look at it and keep saying, he's... Uh, Went a little bit long this morning again. Um, and I probably will. That's why I took it down. But, you know, now it's kind of like when you get a shot. It's like if you turn your head, you probably won't feel it as much. If you sit there and watch it, it's like, ow. And that's why I just took it away. But look, okay, look at the Bible. 2 Timothy 2. Now, young <clears throat> soldiers, when we're out there on the boulevard, 2 Timothy 2. Uh, they did, it's kind of like a reenactment of the, the guys holding the flag at Iwo Jima. It was young guys. I don't know if they're young Marines or something. It was pretty neat. They're all dressed up, and uh, they held the flag. They marched down the sidewalk, and literally five, seven feet from where I was street preaching, these guys did this flag reenactment, and I couldn't help but say something. I was like, you know what? This is honorable. This was honorable what these men did. But how much more honorable was Jesus Christ hanging on that cross for you? And we'll sit here and we'll applaud these men. And then when someone brings up Jesus, we cringe. You know? And um, 2 Timothy 2, verse 3, it says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good, what? Soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who had chosen him to be a soldier. Now, think of a soldier that was never willing to finish boot camp. Think of a soldier that was never willing to learn how to make his bed. Think of a soldier that was never willing to learn hand-to-hand -hand combat. Think of a soldier that was never willing to wake up early, and yet when the war begins, this very soldier thinks he's ready for combat. He's a joke. Uh, this soldier is unfit because he was not willing to do the first things, like what? Sir, yes, sir. That's the first things. Uh, you're not going to meet a soldier that never learned how to say, Sir, yes, sir. It's not even yes, sir. It's sir, yes, sir. If you miss the first one, you've got to say it all over again. And uh, when, when God says it's time to move, sir, yes, sir. <laughs> These are the basic things. These are the first things. So when God came to the man of God, he said, go to Eli. That's why we read, there came a man of God unto Eli. You don't read about an argument between him and God, do you? It's not there. You, know, you could do a whole study on that with, with men that walk with God, men that were called friend of God. And when God tells them to do the next verse, they were doing it. Are you a friend of God? Are you a man of God? Do you want to be a man of God? Um, now, uh, look at Luke 4.1. Luke chapter 4 and verse 1. Take you back to the wilderness. Luke 4, 1. Now look at this. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. Where? Now, doesn't that hurt anyone's doctrine right there? I thought if you're right with God, you're healthy, wealthy, and wise. And you're driving a Lexus. You, you have the license plate cover that says, Don't let the car fool you. My true treasure's in heaven. That's the license plate cover I'd get for it. <laughs> Why? Because as I'm like, Oh my goodness, there's a scratch. I'm like, Merry Christmas, slow down. Oh, this is my baby. We got to wash it again. It's just like, how many hours have people spent on waxing? Okay, I'm not saying if you clean your car, you're sinful. But I'm saying, for instance, you go to the boulevard. It was a big car show. Those are ten gods on four wheels. They are. They are. I'll say it. And a lot of them are Christians. 
Now think about how much money that was on that boulevard that should have went to the mission field from Christians that own those things. Think about how many Bibles could have been printed. Think about how many tracts could have been printed. I'm not saying it's sinful to have a nice thing, okay? But what's excessive? What's excessive? I don't know. God will tell you. But if you want to be a man of God, if it's time to sell the car, He'll let you know. He'll let you know. You know, if it becomes an idol, He'll let you know. Amen. So, but what do we notice here in Luke 4 1 is that being led by God doesn't always lead to health, wealth, and wisdom. Sometimes it leads to a wilderness. Now, a lot of you are smarter than Jesus. You're like, what? Yeah, you're smarter than Jesus. I didn't know I was smarter than Jesus. You are. You really are. Think about it. Because as you sit on the edge of the wilderness, feeling the Holy Ghost pulling you into trials and trouble, you already see what lies ahead. And so you don't go. See? You're smarter than Jesus. You know, Jesus, see, he was still learning, obedience, all that stuff. See, you've already come to the pinnacle, you know. And you see, as, he's, as the Holy Spirit's like, come, come. And you're like, ha, 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 I know what you're leading me. I'm not going there. You see? Because you're smarter than Jesus. Now, um... <laughs> So you dig your feet in the dirt so hard that God Himself couldn't move you. You know? And you say, He must not have known what was ahead in the wilderness. Jesus. He didn't know, but I know. And uh, I'm smarter than that, you say. Now, I'll give you three examples. Number one, the disciples were sent by Jesus into a storm, and they went. Okay, uh, Legion, after freed from the devils... Remember, he just wanted to hang out with Jesus. Jesus said, go home. He sent him home, and he went. Now, yet you were sent by God into the wilderness of inconvenience, and you will not go. And you, you've heard probably 50 million times, I'll tell you again, is the only place that gold can get refined is in the fire. And you see that furnace, and it's getting mighty close. And you keep pulling back. And God's like, I just want to refine you. I just want to clean you up a little bit. Ha, 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 I'm smarter than that, God. Yeah, you're so smart, you're going to keep on holding on to all that stuff. Now, uh, uh, what made this man a God was he was willing to go where God told him to go. Uh, this set him apart and made him stand out to God. Uh, even if he was a nameless individual, he never got credit. Even to this day. We don't know who he was. He was just a man of God. Now, um, thirdly, are you willing to say what God told you to say? Why do I keep doing that? Or I'll just put, are you willing to say it? How about that? Okay. It's too long to write and my writing's too ugly. Are you willing to say what God told you to say? We're in 1 Samuel 2.27. And it says, And there came a man of God unto Eli, and said unto him, what did he say? Thus saith the Lord. That's offensive. He, you, you know what a lot of preachers today say? Thus saith my opinion. Thus saith how I see it. Thus saith my experience. Um, a man of God will say what the Lord has asked him to say. This could be as easy as simply saying to somebody you're actually praying for, I'm praying for you. I don't know if you've ever felt the inkling that maybe just to call someone. You know, um, a while ago, you know, actually for a long time, I'd been thinking about Brother Bobby Utley. And he's a preacher. He's preached at the blowout a number of times. He's an excellent preacher, old school guy. Uh, man, just, I, I just love those old, old guys that have just followed God through thick and thin. And I just feel like you could learn so much from that. And I, I felt for a long time that I should call him and just thank him for being faithful. And I waited too long. 
I waited too long, and I'll just be honest with you, I thought Brother Bobby Utley died. Because he was so old when I seen him years ago. And I was just like, I don't know, I finally came down to it, and I, I called Matt Crane because he knows everybody. I was like, do you have Bobby Utley's number? He's like, no, I don't. You probably go search him on the website. I was like, is he dead? He said, no, I just got some recording from him or something. I was like, oh my goodness, he's still alive. And anyway... I was like, Merry Christmas, find Bobby Utley's church. So anyway, she pulled it up and and uh, I called and there was no answer. I left a message. I called again, no answer, left a message. And um, I don't know what it was, if it was the next day or something, there was this voice on the line that said, this is Bobby Utley. Did you call? And I was like, Bobby Utley? He said, yeah. I was like, I, I got to be honest with you. I started like bawling in tears, man. I was like, I thought you were dead, brother. And he's like, he kind of chuckled. He said, you know, no, I'm still here. I said, I have been fighting God for so long. I mean, not like in a fist fight with him, but just God would say, do it. And I was just like, oh, I'll get around to it later. And, but I thought I waited so long that I couldn't do it anymore. You know, and, and, uh, but by God's grace, I got in touch with him. And I just said, you know, God's been telling me to give you a call and just thank you for being faithful, brother. And this is just coming from some Californian desert rat out here, some no-name guy. But I just want to say thank you. And uh, anyway, his associate pastor called me like a week later and said, he really appreciated that, brother. Now, all that to say what? That I'm an idiot? You knew that when you came here. But you don't want to wait too long because... It might never happen. You know, if God's telling you, tell that person you're praying for them, you better do it. You know, maybe th maybe that's the point they need it. You know, uh, if you wait another moment, uh, maybe it'll be too late. Um, you know, I, I've heard I've heard stories of an individual going door knocking, and the guy just felt like knocking a few more times. Finally, the door opens. And uh, just a crack. What do you want? Fishes the track through. Read this. Closes the door. Guy didn't think anything of it. Then, uh, lo and behold, maybe 10, 15 years later, the, the preacher that handed the guy the track gets approached by some face after a service. Do you remember me? <laughs> no. <laughs> I've never seen you in my life. He said, you know what? You gave me a track one day. And I just cracked open the door. I said, what do you want? You give me a track. He said, you know, I want to tell you the story. Um, I was up... I was up in the attic. And uh, I was standing on a chair, putting my head in a noose. And I was about to kill myself. And uh, that's why it took me so long to come down to the door. He said, he, he gave me the track and I ran back up because I was still convinced I was going to do it. And I sat down and I started reading that track and I got saved. And it was just because an inkling of God saying, knock again. Now, uh, <clears throat> people are going through hard things, and there could be those little inklings are for a reason. That God is like, tell that brother you're praying for him. Go tell that sister, go give that sister a hug, lady, you know. I'm not all into men hugging women. <laughs> I don't, don't want you to think all that, okay? I'm, but sometimes God will go tell you to encourage somebody. And it's probably for a reason. Now, um, thus saith the Lord is a good way to start if you're going to be a man of God. Thus saith the Lord. Now, I want to show you something that's not often spoken of, but Moses didn't do it. Look at uh, Exodus chapter 4. We're in Exodus chapter 4, and look at verse 
4.22. And it says this, it says, uh, Exodus 4.22, Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. And I say unto thee, Let my son go, that he may serve me. And if thou refuse to let him go, behold, I will slay thy son, even thy firstborn. Now, uh, turn the page, go to Exodus 5, verse 1. Let's see what Moses actually tells him. It says here in Exodus uh, 5, 1, And afterward Moses and Aaron went in and told Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may hold a feast unto me in the wilderness. You forgot something, Moses. Now... You can get a lot of speculation from that, too. Did, did he hate Pharaoh so much that he just... Oh, that's what you're going to do, God? Amen. I don't know. But what, what, what I do know is that he didn't say, Thus saith the Lord right there. He omitted to say something. And uh, you hear a lot of people accusing others of not preaching the whole counsel of God. Now, uh, they'll critique a church like ours that we will have occasionally, we'll do topical messages. And they, they think that that is the worst thing that you could possibly do because you're, you're not going to preach the whole counsel of God that way. You know, and the best way, now this is what Calvary Chapel says, and I kind of jumped the gun. I shouldn't have told you so early. But they say, oh, we do verse by verse. So, you know, we have the whole counsel of God. And that's what we do. So if your church does topical, you guys are like the Antichrist. You guys are like, don't you know what the Bible says about taking away, taking away? And you guys are just, you know, tiptoeing through the tulips or, you know, kind of picking and choosing what you want. We go verse by verse. And we're like, you know, I mean, if you've never heard that reasoning before, you're like, Wow. Are we really just like picking and choosing? Now I want to I want to say a couple things to that. Um, they gloss over controversial subjects when they're going verse by verse. Yeah, that's, good. that's what they do. That's right. Well, Randy, you're just picking on, but you just talk. Uh, you know. Um, now God puts those controversial subjects in His Word, and and that's to test the heart of the preacher too. If he has the fear of man uh, because they're fishing in a big pond. <laughs> Calvary Chapel Distinctus. I, I know, if you've been here for a little while, we talk about this every so often. But uh, this, this is where Pastor Randy came from. Right here. I got a couple quotes out of this book. Chuck Smith said it best. He said, uh, some people object because they feel like I gloss over certain passages of Scripture. And they're correct. But glossing over controversial issues is often deliberate. Well, how often do you do it? It's often deliberate uh, because there are usually two sides. And I've found it's important not to be divisive. And listen to this. Listen to this and not to allow people to become polarized on issues. Not to allow people? Hmm. Because the moment they're polarized, there's division. Is all division bad? Hmm. Separate yourself. Huh, that sounds a little too biblical for this guy. Well, he also said, but Calvary Chapel has a sort of mystique about it. What, what do these people believe? I don't know, but let's go and find out. And the whole field is ours. That's what they want. You, you know, they leave a mystique. Uh, you want to fish in as big as a pond as you can find. When you're marketing something, you want the largest market appeal as possible. So don't chop up the market and say, well, we're just going to fish in this little market here. Keep the market broad. And fish in the big pond. Fish where they're biting. We go verse by verse. You gloss over the verses. 
it doesn't stop there. You guys walk, walk past the church sign, so it's going to come to no surprise. Also, how could it be possible to give the whole counsel of God if you don't have the whole counsel of God? Oh, we go verse by verse. You're missing verses. <laughs> I mean, you would have a better argument if you had all the verses. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, or how about this? Or even if you believe that you had the whole counsel of God. Most of these guys, you ask them, where is the perfect inspired word of God? And can I get a copy right now? Pastor, please. And they say, impossible. Uh, so we know he, he in First Samuel was a man of God because he had God on his breath and he was speaking often about him. This is the mark of a spiritual man. He didn't shudder from saying, thus saith the Lord. Now, it should go without saying that the man of God will say what God told him to say. Everything God told him to say. All of it. Now, when he says it, he believes that God told him to say everything he is to say. Otherwise, he's no man of God. What does that mean? You can't sit up here and say, Thus saith the Lord, and come down and say, But it's wrong here, 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 and here. And, you know, I go to a lexicon here. And, you know, uh, I use uh, my Greek uh, over here. And, oh, that's an unfortunate rendering. And, you know what? You lied the whole time you said, Thus saith the Lord. You held up that Bible, and you're a dirty, rotten, stinking liar. That's right. Amen. Have a nice day. Mickey Mouse. Okay. Now, are you willing... First, not to be, uh, to be a nobody. Are you willing to go where God told you to go? Are you willing to say what God told you to say? How about this? Are you willing to point out the positive? Now, this is something our group has a rough time with. Well. This means, are you willing to? Okay? <clears throat> are you willing to point out the positive? Now, in verse 28, 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 28, it says, And I did choose him out all the tribes of Israel to be my priests, to offer mine upon mine altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me. And did I give the house of thy father all the offerings made by fire? Hey, man, these are all great things. They're great things. Those are the good things that Eli was offered. Amen. <laughs> now, in the world, they have worldly methods, obviously. Effective ways uh, to speak and correct people. And what do they call it? Sugar, salt, sugar. You ever heard that? This is how you talk to people. You know, sugar, salt, sugar. You know, when, when I was in working in the bank, they taught you how to write people up and they say do sugar salt sugar you're like what's that well say something good that they're doing then blast them for what they're doing wrong and then end it on a positive note and that kind of helps people to swallow it a little bit easier now uh not everything in the world is completely unbiblical if the world has any sense you could find it in the in the bible and I'm, what am I showing you here is you just found, maybe not sugar, salt, sugar, you found sugar, salt. Okay, so maybe the third one they added. But what? He started with the good things first. He said, hey man, God offered you all these good things. They were great. Don't you remember those days when, when you first met God and, oh, you were so happy about the priesthood, Eli, and you were floating down the aisle, like, you know, just, you, you were just happy in Jesus. Don't you remember all that? And he, Eli is kind of going back in his head and he's like, I do remember all that. Oh, those were good days back then. And, uh, but what, what is the bigger thing that we're to learn here is using tact with people. Use tact. Tact. Yeah. <laughs> when you're talking to somebody, look at them. That's a good start. That's nice. You know, it's not like, hey, uh, can you uh, so-and-so and do that? You know, uh, how, how long would your mom allow you to speak to her like that? <laughs> oh, why'd you do that? You wouldn't even look at me. All right? That's what? Disrespectful. Look at somebody when you're talking. Use tact. 
Um, now, Baptist preachers today, they often omit the positive. Okay. Now, uh, they want to paint God as sitting on a cloud ready to zap your behind with a lightning bolt. And uh, omitting that it's in the Bible. And I'm going to say it. At the risk of my reputation, God is a God of love. He is. Amen. And He is forgiving. He's a forgiving God. And He's a saving. What, why do they call Him a Savior? What, what does a Savior do? He saves. Amen. Now, uh, you think about this. You think about uh, the Gospel. It's the death, burial, bad, bad. And what? Resurrection. Good. <laughs> There's something good about all this bad stuff. There's something good. Uh, you think about preaching, it's rebuke, reprove, exhort, exhort. <laughs> hey, you can do it. With God's power, you can do it. We can get up. We can go out. We can get them. We can... You see what I'm saying? It's not just, you bad sinner, you're going to burn. Oh, look at you, sinner. You're all a bunch of sinners. You know, it's like, hey, Jesus died for sinners. <laughs> Amen. I qualify. You see? Um, uh, now, we cannot omit that God, think about this, is a God of comfort who goes to prepare a place for you. He's called the Comforter who holds your tears in a bottle. He has your name graven, uh, graven in His hands. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to be holy. He wants you to have true joy. He wants to give you a purpose. And He wants to give you a plan. And this God is the same God that showed up on the seas of Galilee saying to the storms, Peace be still. He was up on that cross cross he said it is finished think about this there's coming a day there'll be no more tears no more pain no more suffering and no baptist preacher wants to talk about it they just want to kick you in the rear end and say you're coming short here you're coming short here coming short here and yeah mr preacher you're pretty short yourself you see what I'm saying? Uh, are you willing to point out the positive? The man of God did. He pointed out the positive. He said, Eli, when things began, man, there were just peaches and cream with you. It was just beautiful. Do you remember those days, Mr. Eli? And you know what? The man of God started out positive with a, a kind of Eli's eulogy. And there's no excuse for not using tact in a conversation with people. You go back to Paul and Mars Hill in Acts chapter 17. And you know what? Uh, he used tact. He started using their culture. Uh, he spent some time thinking about what he was going to say to them. Okay? And uh, granted, God gave him the very words. I get it. But... He will use what you give Him to use. Okay? If you never read, <laughs> you never think, uh, you can't think that you're going to be some eloquent speaker when you finally stand up and try to talk for God. You're, you're going to be like, I don't know English. Well, because you never spent five minutes trying to learn it. You see? Why? God wants to use you. What is He working with? What's he working with? Well, I don't believe anybody should have to go to Bible school. Okay. <laughs> All right. Then that would be that much less God has to use. Well, there's people that, you know, didn't go to Bible school. And yeah, you're using an exception. And an exception proves the rule. Okay. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> There's a lot of guys that didn't go to Bible school and God used them. And guess what? Uh, they're not the majority. I don't think that anyone in here is going to be the exception. Uh, see, the Bible still commands you in 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman, need not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You need to study. You. Not your neighbor. You. Well, I'm not a preacher. I know. But you need to study. <laughs> You need to be ready to give account. You need to be ready to give every man an answer. Amen? And uh, the man of God, he kind of starts out. You think about Paul on Mars Hill. He used tact. He used their culture. He thought about what he was going to say. And then, man, he gave it to him. Didn't he? You think about Stephen before the Sanhedrin in Acts 7, uh, verse 2. He said, Men and brethren, fathers, hearken! The God of glory appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Sharon. And they're like, Yeah! Yeah! Yeah, this is good! Preach! Preach! 
And then he ends it with this. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and hard in ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. Uh, as, your father did, as your fathers did, so do ye. Uh, which of the prophets have, uh, have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before the coming of the just one, um, whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. He used tact. He used tact. He pointed out the positive. It takes five seconds, doesn't it? It's good. Not everybody is doing everything wrong. They're doing some things right. Uh, I mean, I'm no example, but guys coming down Lancaster Boulevard when we're out there, he's got his little, little buddy on his shoulders. I was like, man, that's a beautiful gift from God right there. He said, I know. And I was, I was just like, you know, God's going to ex expect you to raise him in the ways of the Lord. Amen. You know, but because I, because I said something positive first, he gave me the time of day. If I would have just said, you're a little wicked sinner on your wicked shoulders is going to burn in hell with you. You, you, know, you see what I'm saying? What did I do? I spent two seconds and what did I do? I tried to use some tact. Amen. I got his ear for a second. Amen. But you can go throughout the whole Bible. This is not an exhaustive list of examples of people of the Lord using tact in conversing. Okay? It takes a little bit of thought. And God expects you to use your mind every so often. Now, a man of God is not only going to be pointing out the positive, but he'll point out the pointed. Now, if you're plan planning on being a man of God, are you willing to point out the pointed? I'll just write it here. And that's pretty much the rest of our uh, text. He pointed out the pointed. Now, specifically, what I'll show you here is verse 34. We're in 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 34. And this shall be a sign unto thee, that shall come upon thy two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas, in one day they shall die, both of them. Have a nice day. Oh, you know your kids that you love so much? You know, you, you raise them, you used to clean their diapers. Uh, yeah, they're going to be uh, dead in one day. But did I mention, thus saith the Lord? Now, uh, this man of God was willing to have a hard conversation, and that's why God used him. Uh, are you willing to be a man of God and say even the hard things? If you're going to be a man of God, you have to point out the pointed. And uh, there's a famous debater that has actually had, had some good material uh, about debating atheists. And I was checking him out. And um, he was at a university, and an atheist girl explained to him that she was not in agreement with the Bible, that she didn't believe that Jesus died and rose again. And then she just asked him point blank, if I die like this, am I going to hell? Now, to me, I'm like, answer the question. <laughs> And he backs off. And to some aspect, it was tactful. He made her define her terms, which is fine. What do you mean you don't believe the Bible? What do you mean? He made her define everything. What do you mean hell? Things like that. She said a place of fire. Hell. Yeah, isn't it interesting sometimes what the world knows? Amen. They know exactly what it's about. It, it's, right. it's just when you get educated scholars that they forget everything. Um, then this guy explains that God is not going to force anyone into, into heaven that doesn't want to be there, and that's fine. Okay. But then uh, she asked him again, if she died in that state, was she going to go into the flames of hell? And he beat around the bush again. And then he tried to weasel out. And he's now added to our hell is a metaphorical, not literal list with Billy Graham and R.C. Sproul. And it's Frank Turek. And he actually has some good material on atheists. 
and, and he started saying, well, you know, the Bible uses metaphors. And she said, how do you know the whole Bible is not a metaphor? I was like, good question. That's a good question. Because the world is not as stupid as you think. And it would have been much plainer to her. God had already been dealing with her. She was like borderline tears asking him, BTW, by the way. I don't know why I said that text message language. Um, she was kind of choked up, kind of asking him. And you know what? He could have said, you know, honey, if you do die in that state, you will go to hell and you will burn forever. But Jesus Christ died so you don't have to. Not, oh, well, hell is just separation from God. Just kind of like, well, the Bible uses kind of like metaphors, you know. I'm sorry, my friend. I'm sorry. Now, think about this. Jesus coined the term hell fire. Was he mistaken? Now, uh, turn over to Matthew 9. Oh, we got rid of the clock. <laughs> I'll just read these. Matthew 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell into the fire. That shall never be quenched. Matthew 9, 45. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter and in, in, uh, haul into life than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire. Uh, that shall never be quenched. But then, right here, Matthew 9, 47, And if thy eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to, uh, to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire. Mark, what, what verse you got? Isn't it Mark? Open Mark? Oh, uh, yeah. Was I saying Matthew? Uh, it's all Mark. Mark 9.43, Mark 9.45, Mark 9.47. Thank you, brother. Just checking you guys, you see? He coined the term hell fire there. Was he mistaken? <laughs> You're smarter than Jesus, aren't you? See, I know what he meant to say, because that wouldn't be very seeker-sensitive. That's what he said. And furthermore, we go over to Luke 16. Luke 16, the dreaded Luke 16. Oh, not Luke 16 again. Yes, Luke 16. And we look at verse 23, and it says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip his tip, uh, the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am in outer darkness and separation from God. I am in Hades. <laughs> I'm in Sheol, whatever they want to... No, I'm tormented in this flame. Just in case you weren't sure about what hellfire meant, the Bible defines itself. Tormented in this flame. It's a place of real fire. Now, I, I've heard some people say, Oh, well, it says outer darkness, and, and fire brings light, and so darkness couldn't... That's a contradiction. Uh, from what I understand, I'm not some fireman, but I've heard that heat can get so hot, it does turn black. And, like, there's black spots on the sun, isn't there? There is. And, I mean, I don't even have a telescope. You know, uh, but all I can know is this. When thus saith the Lord, done said it, it meant what it said. It means fire, and it means darkness, and you don't want to go there, okay? And it's not going to help if I omit that fact, okay? That if you reject Jesus Christ, you will go to hell. It's not going to help you if I omit that. You know, it would have been better for that, for that guy to just admit it and say, you know what, that is what the Bible says, honey. You know, but the reason I'm here today is because I want to give you a way out. Jesus Christ provided the way out. And I'm just the arrow. I'm just an arrow pointing to Jesus. You know, uh, I think that would have still been a respectful way to answer that. 
Amen. That would have been a tactful way to answer that and not compromise the truth of the Word of God or cast doubt upon the words of God. She, what did she do? She uh, took the roof off. Uh, what did she do? She did the road runner with him. Uh, these are all debate tactics. What? He said, oh, well, that's kind of metaphorically. Then she said, well, isn't the whole Bible metaphorically then? Interesting. So think about this. What kind of mechanic would never speak of the car being broken? How many times would you take your car there? you like, the, the mechanic's like, oh, this is a great car. Wow. Look at the paint. Man, it's so good. Yeah, my air conditioner doesn't work. It's 100 degrees outside. Oh, man, the seats are leather. This is great. You know, and, and he's sitting in it, and he, he's like, oh, the steering wheel is amazing. Man. And, sir, my car is broken. Oh, what? No, it looks pretty good. Pretty good. Are you even a mechanic? Uh, what kind of doctor would never allow the people to know they have cancer? That's a hard conversation, isn't it? Uh, what, what kind of termite inspector could never let the people know they have termites? That's a hard conversation, isn't it? Uh, what kind of dentist could never let you know that you have a cavity? That's a hard conversation. Mainly because you don't want to pay for a fill-in, another fill-in. <laughs> but hey, you got to drink your soda pop. <laughs> But the devil will try to make you to have a fear of man to quench the Holy Spirit, which has chosen these specific words to make people free. It's not your words. It's not your tact It's that has the promise. It's not the way you've been trained in the elitist group of the alumni that you are the number one debater. God chose these specific words to make people free. And uh, although there are some words in the Bible that you're even uncomfortable allowing your children to hear, they are the words of life. And, uh, and if you ever think that you are to be a man of God, you're going to have to allow God and His Word the rightful place. What? Higher than you. Uh, look at John 3.33 and we'll end here. John chapter 3 and verse 30. And this is John the Baptist talking. And he said this, he said, He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. God, we thank you so much for your mercy and grace. We thank you, God, for your word, for your truth. And Lord, if we're ever going to be what you want us to be, God, we must de decrease. You must increase. And I just pray, God, that your word have the preeminence today. And that, God, your people here would not be tossed to and fro with every wave of doctrine, but would have the final authority, the words of truth, the pure words, the holy words of God in the King James Bible to dictate what their thoughts are to dictate what they'll do in their life, God, and to dictate the God of the Bible. And Lord, you gave us who you are in writing. We don't have to wonder. Lord, we don't have to wonder uh, what we're supposed to do, what we're to glory in. God, your word says that we're to glory in the cross and um, not, not in all these uh, things that we want to glory in, these things of the world. God, I pray for your folks here. That you'd protect them, strengthen them. Pray that those weren't, that were not able to make it would come next week. And pr bring them back, God, safe. And um, we thank you for everything we have, a, a place to meet. And thank you for the air conditioner. It's so hot outside, and yet we're, we're feeling pretty good in here. Lord, I just pray that your word would not return unto you void, like your Bible says that it would accomplish its purpose in all of our hearts. In the name of Jesus, amen.